Okay, I've started the recorder. So you don't get very far into it. No. Be the North Pole, and one will be the South Pole, which were named as such because of the way a suspended bar magnet will orient with respect to the cardinal direction. This is how a compass works. It's just a So basically what he's saying is any type of bar magnet, if you set it down, it will orient itself to where it matches up with the uh, magnetic pose of the Earth. And we're going to talk about the magnetic pose of the Earth here in a little bit, okay? Which is why a compass works the way it works. Magnetic needle that always points north. Like poles repel and opposite poles attract, just like electric charges. The difference is that opposite charges can be isolated, whereas no matter how many times you cut a magnet in half, it will always contain both poles. All right, so like when we were talking about electricity, you could isolate it. Like we, the polarized pole, which meant half of it was uh, positive and half of it was negative, and we could cut that in half and have half just negative and half just positive, right? They showed that to us on the video yesterday. Can't do that with magnets. Every time you cut a bar magnet in half, or even other kinds of magnet, it still will always have its north and south pole. Okay? So if I came up here and I cut this in half, still the same. Still the same. It's just smaller. And it doesn't matter if I cut it in half, if I cut it in thirds, if I cut it in fourths, like if I cut it over here and fourth of it's over here, because I cut it in the other three-fourths over here, this fourth is still going to have a north and south pole. The three-fourths of it will still have a north and south pole. Okay? So that, and you need to know that. No matter how many times you cut it, or break it, or split it apart, or whatever, a magnet will always have a north and south pole. To fully understand the properties of matter, that allow for magnetic behavior, we must understand the electron configurations of the atoms in the magnet. And we must therefore... So, electrons have a lot to do with electricity, right? They also have a lot to do with magnets. Or learn some chemistry. If you're interested, you can check out my general chemistry series for more atomic knowledge than you can shake a stick at. But for our purposes here, it will suffice to understand that most materials contain atoms with all of their electrons paired up in orbitals. All right, so most substances or materials that we have on Earth, um, their electrons are paired up. So like here's two electrons, here's two electrons, here's two electrons, okay? And, that's the, and they pair up in the orbits. What's another name for orbits? Where do the electrons live? We learned this last year. Where do our electrons live? No, protons live in the nucleus. Where do the electrons live? Starts with an S. The shells. The shells. Shells and orbitals. I thought you were, and then you stopped. Uh, shells and orbitals, orbitals are the same thing. Okay, so, and while they're in there, one of them will spin upwards and the other one will spin downwards. That's the reason your arrows are going different directions. So that's in most substances. Like, can you magnetize a piece of material? Yes. Yes? Yeah. Really? How, how are we going to do that, Jake? How are we going to magnetize my shirt right here? Well, not that kind of material. Yeah, you just told me. Well, you we can, can magnetize a piece of material. So what are you thinking of when you think of material? Metal. Okay, that's a certain type of material. Oh, okay, so let's do it this way. Can you magnetize? I'll go along with what you're saying, Jay. I, I was misleading. So let's put it this way. Can you magnetize your clothing? No. No. Now, if you have a metal button on it, I guess you could magnetize. But you still aren't magnetizing the actual clothing. You're just magnetizing the button, right? That's because most substances or most things have e 
electrons that are paired up in the orbitals. You can't magnetize them. One spins one way, the other spins the other. So everybody got the stem? It's one spin up and one spin down, such that they cancel each other out. But some substances, like iron, cobalt, and nickel, have electrons that aren't canceled out. And some of these can be called ferromagnetic. All right, so some stem substances have unpaired electrons. So when you have unpaired electrons, then you can magnetize it. And you need to know that some of those materials are called, or would be iron, cobalt, and um, nickel, okay? And when they're unpaired, some of them will be paired and have spinners going in opposite directions at that moment. And some of them don't have pairs, okay? And when that happens, they're called ferromagnetisms. Mag mag magnetisms. Ferromagnetisms. Which I don't really care. I mean, I'm probably not going to ask you that, what the name of that is. In these materials, the atoms will adopt an orientation such that all of their net spins are aligned in... All right, so if they are and have an uneven number of electrons or pairs of electrons, all of the spinners will start spinning in the same direction. Even the ones that are paired will start spinning in the same direction. And that means they are all aligned up in a parallel fashion. Okay, so the, the spinners all align up in a parallel direction or fashion where they're all going the same direction, okay? So all of our electrons are now going in the same direction. Of the ones that are unpaired atoms, okay? That's what parallel does. fashion. And this phenomenon, which we can refer to. And this phenomenon, this event, when this happens, you could put that in there, probably easier for you to understand. When this happens, that creates a magnetic domain. Creates a magnetic, magnetic domain. And that domain will generate a magnetic field. So all the spinners, all the electrons start spinning in the same direction. They align up parallel. And when that happens, they, that creates a magnetic domain. And that domain will generate a magnetic field. So your magnetic field is just like your electrical field that we talked about yesterday. Depending on how strong the electric is, the electric charge is, depend, that bases on how big the field is, right? Same way with the magnetic field. So depending on how big the magnetic field is, depends on how strong the magnetic charge is, okay? And the closer you are to the actual center of that field, just like with electricity, the more force there is. So if I'm here and I've got a, I've got a metal suit on, that magnet is gonna draw me in, I'll be stuck like this, right? But if I'm over here, the force isn't near as strong, is it? So I have a good chance of getting out of the field before the magnet sucks me back in, just like the electricity. The electricity gets me here, but I'm here, I might can outrun the electricity. I might still get electrocuted, but it will just be like electric fence. It won't be like dead, right? Same thing. So they have a lot of the same characteristics. And you're gonna find that gravity does too. All three of these kind of, kind of go together. To as a magnetic domain will generate a magnetic field. A magnetic field can be depicted using field lines, just like an electric field. And though they will appear to begin at the north pole of the magnet and end at the south pole, they so have... So they're just like that, uh, just like the electric one, that the charge comes out of what? The negative end, right? 
So the negative end would be the north. So it's coming out of the north and it goes into the south end, right? So the electricity goes into the positive. The same. Same directions. Have no true ends. They are closed loops that continue through the magnet itself. In this way, Earth itself is a giant bar magnet with a magnetic north pole about 1,500. All right, so you need to know that Earth is basically a gigantic bar magnet. Earth itself is a, is a giant, giant bar, bar magnet. Bar magnet. And, um, that mag and the Earth has a magnetic north pole. And the Earth has a magnetic north pole, which means it also has a magnetic what? Yeah. South pole. Yes. Now, there is a difference between the north magnetic pole and the geographical pole. So when you hear the north pole, what's the first thing that comes into your head? Santa. 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 We all know that Santa lives at the north pole. And the north pole is where? It's so on the top of the of Earth, right? It's so on the top. So if I took off walking from here and I headed north, I would eventually end up at the North Pole, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that's the geographical North Pole, okay? So the distance, the difference between the two distance is 1,500 kilometers. So... You have the north, the geographical north pole, and then you have the north uh, magnetic pole. And if you notice, they're not completely lined up together. You notice that? Okay. So, is the magnetic north pole the same as the north pole? No. No. Same way with the south pole. They're the same, pretty much the same distance apart too, that 1,500 kilometers. Magnetic North Pole, about 1,500 kilometers from the geographic North Pole, and the magnetic South Pole, about the same distance from the geographic South Pole. The geographic poles mark Earth's axis of rotation. Okay, so you should know this. You should know that the geographic poles is uh, the Earth's rotation axis, right? That's where the... That imaginary line is that, that imaginary pole that runs through the earth that the earth rotates on. You should already know that, but if you want to put it down in your notes, you can. Now, that being said, arc Earth's axis of rotation, but the magnetic poles exist because of the way atoms are distributed in Earth's iron core. Which All right, so magnetic poles has nothing to do with the way. The Earth spins like the geographical poles do. It has to do with the way Earth has distributed distributed the arm within the Earth's core. Okay? That's the reason they're not in sync uh, with each other, the geographical one and the magnetic one. Now, we all know that the center of Earth is made out of iron, right? And we'll go deeper into this, and there's some other stuff that he's going to talk about that we'll go deeper into when we get into Earth science and we learn about the Big Bang Theory, and we learn about gravity, we learn more about the gravity force, magnetic force, strong force, and the weak force. But um, the very core of Earth is liquid. It's not a solid. And then as you come out, it becomes solid. So if you are a liquid, do liquids move around? Yes. So your magnetic poles over the years will move some in one direction or another, depending on how that liquid in the, in the earth is moving. So it all has to do with the way it's distributed. And what makes it be distributed different ways at different times is that movement. Okay, but it takes a lot of years for it to move very much at all. To line their spins just like the atoms in a bar magnet. The magnetic poles actually change their position slightly over thousands of years as material in the core changes position. 
There is so much magnetized material in the Earth's core that the magnetic field generated is absolutely immense, stretching far out into space. And the magnetic this field, field is interacts very with high energy charged particles we'll that race that towards us from the sun right now, yeah, and okay. deflects them towards the magnetic poles to produce the aurora borealis when these particles collide with molecules in our atmosphere. These become excited and release colorful light upon relaxing back to the ground state. Without the Earth's magnetic field, we would be at tremendous risk from this kind of radiation, and life on Earth probably wouldn't be possible. Electric current is able to deflect a compass needle, and magnetic fields affect the paths of particles with electric charge. So it wasn't long until we realized that electricity and magnetism were two sides of the same coin, which was then dubbed the electromagnetic force. We now okay. So what it means by it's two sides of a it's the same side of a of a coin means they have a whole lot of characteristics are the same and they work together well. Okay, they're different. And, and, you're, and we're going to find out that our gravity force is the same way. So all three of them have a lot in common. So I consider them, I would call them, instead of saying they're related, I say they're cousins. Okay? So if you think about your cousin, especially your first cousins, um, do you have the, some of the same DNA that your cousin has? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah? yeah. All right? Because maybe it's... Maybe when you're talking about your cousin, you're talking about your dad and your dad's brothers and their kids. So you're going to have some of the same DNA because they both, both your dads had the same dad. Both you and your cousins had the same grandpa, right? So you have some of the same characteristics. You have some of the same DNA. You have some of the same characteristics. You might even look a little like your cousin. You might have the same nose or the same eyes, same type of hair, okay? But are you different from your cousin? Are you the same person as your cousin? No. no. So that's the same way that I, that's how I look at the electrical forces and the magnetic forces and the um, gravitational forces as their cousins. They like to go out and play together. You like to go out and hang out with your cousins and do stuff. Most people do. Anyway, yeah. And you share some of the same DNA. You might look the same. But when it comes down to the bare brass, brass of it, you are your own individual, right? And that's the same way as your electric and your magnetic and your gravity forces and fields are. They have a lot of the same characteristics. They work or play good really well with each other, but they are also their own individual thing, okay? And that's how we came up with the... Uh, electromagnetic force. So you have electromagnetic waves and we have electromagnetic force. And we'll learn more about the electromagnetic force and how it came about when we study the Big Bang Theory in our science. I realize this is true because it is the motion and orientation of electrons that produce magnetic fields. We can use the right hand rule to show that if you grasp a current carrying wire in your right hand, with the thumb pointing in the direction of the current, your other fingers will wrap in the direction of the magnetic field that is generated by the current. All right, so this is called the right hand rule. So that's like when we talked about testing an electric fence and I told you you should never go up and test it this way because your hand will automatically wrap around it. Because most people in here are right handed, yes? So most people are gonna grab or test the electric or whatever you're doing, you're gonna do it with your right hand. Most of the time. You know what? I don't have time for that today. So when you grab it with your right hand, your right thumb is pointing in the way the current is going around in that electric fence, right? So your fingers are automatically going to wrap on it. That is called the right hand rule. Okay? That's the reason I say you should always test electrical wires with the back of your hand. Okay? So if I ask on a test to explain or to model the right hand rule, you need to be able to do that.
which it shouldn't be hard because we've talked about it with electric fence and stuff and all that. If you want to draw this diagram right quick in your notes, you may. We later came to understand how... Do I need to go back for a couple of minutes? I can't spend very much time on it, guys. No. Or we won't get done with our notes today. Has everybody got this that wants it? Yep. Mr. Smith, are you with us today? Yeah. Where's your pencil? My eye. Something's in your eye? Like what? You want to go rinse it out with water? Yeah. All right, go to the bathroom and try to rinse it out with some water and see if that helps. And a curfew. We later came to understand how electric and magnetic fields fluctuate together to generate electromagnetic waves. This was the first time two seemingly separate forces were unified, but it wasn't the last. We have been able to unify most of the fundamental forces through our study of modern physics. And one of the primary objectives of physics today is unifying all of them into one grand unified field theory, a so-called theory of everything. Everything we have discussed in this classical physics course was discovered between the 17th and 19th centuries. And at the turn of the 20th century, things got a lot weirder, thanks to Einstein and some of his pals. We learned that things can be both particles and waves, that time flows at different rates for different observers, and that space itself is curved around massive objects. So if you feel like you've sufficiently mastered the concepts presented in this series, I'll see you in the modern physics course. Alright, so now we're going to move on to gravity. We're all familiar with gravity as the reason why chickens fall, but there's much, much more to it. Gravity is a long-range attractive force between all objects with mass. Alright, gravity is a long-range attractive force between all objects with mass. So any object that has mass is affected by gravity one way or another. And all objects that have mass are, are attracted to other objects that have mass. Gravity is a long range attraction force, attractive force between all objects with mass. And so all objects with mass is affected by gravity and all um, objects with mass is attracted to other objects with mass. It's what keeps us from falling off the Earth. It's what keeps the Earth in orbit around the Sun. Alright, so gravity is what keeps us from falling off the Earth. It's what keeps this, um, it keeps the Earth going around the Sun, traveling around the Sun, orbiting around the Sun, whatever you want to call it. So gravity keeps us from falling off the Earth. It keeps the Earth orbiting around the Sun. And Gravity is what caused the sun to form 400 and a half billion years ago. Gravity is what caused the sun itself to form 400 and a half billion years ago. Which I'm not going to make you remember 400 billion years ago, but just know, you need to know that gravity is what caused the sun to form. So, Gravity is a long-range attractive to anything that obtains mass. Any, ob any two objects that have both have mass, they are attracted to each other. Gravity is what keeps us from falling off the earth. 
gravity is what keeps the earth rotating around the sun and gravity also is what caused the sun to form or to be turned. It caused the sun itself to form four and a half billion years ago. It's amazing to think that every mass of object attracts every other in the universe. That means that your dog, the earth, and a black hole in the Andromeda galaxy 2.5 million light years away are all gravitationally attracted to you and you to them. In the 17th century, Isaac Newton discovered that the strength of the gravitational force decreases by the square of the distance between two objects. So if you're twice as far away, gravity is only one fourth as strong. And we know that, right? So the force of gravity works just like the force of electricity and the force of magnets. The further you are away from the force, the least attraction you have. Okay. Excuse me, can I please have that homecoming cord down to the office, please? Thank you. He also discovered that the strength of gravity is proportional to the mass of the objects in question. The more mass of an object, the stronger the gravitational force. All right, so the bigger the object is, the more gravitational force it has. The bigger an object is, or the more mass an object has, is the stronger that the gravitational force is. That's why we can all feel the Earth pulling on us, but don't really notice the pull of the moon. It's smaller and farther away. The moon's gravity is strong enough to cause the tides, though. You know that the moon's gravity is strong enough and it's what causes the tides to move. The gravity has to do with the tides. They have like a connection there. The gravity of the moon, which most people will just say the moon, is what causes the tides in our oceans and seas and stuff. And when I said earlier that gravity is an attraction between objects with mass, I lied, I meant objects with energy. Because in addition to massive objects, gravity also attracts light and other massless but energetic particles, so that a photon of light can be bent slightly past the sun or trapped completely by a black hole. Now do you understand the gravity of the situation? Much, much more massive than the rock. So it moves 
a very, very small distance. And the rock is much less massive, so it moves farther with your stroke than the Earth. Maybe a better way to understand gravity is to take two teenagers in spacesuits and place them far out in space, away from all the planets and the stars. It turns out they will be attracted to each other. I'm not talking about that kind of attraction. See, they have mass, and since they have mass, they will move towards each other. They are attracted to each other. Show you one more thing that might help. Have you ever played with two magnets? You know the magnets with the north and the south poles? When you take the magnets and put them closer to each other, they move together. They are attracted to each other. And the closer they are, the stronger the attraction is. Think of the mass of the object like the strength of a magnet, and the distance between the objects like the distance between the two magnets. Now understand, I'm not saying that gravity and magnetism are the same. They just behave in a similar way. Remember, Let's they have the same one characteristics. Astronauts. You know, astronauts, they weigh less on the moon than on the Earth. Why is that? Well, you see, the moon is less massive than the Earth. Therefore, it has a smaller gravitational pull on the astronaut. Just like the moon is a weaker magnet, they aren't as attracted to each other. Distance also plays a role. Think back to playing with a magnet. The pull of the magnets towards each other are stronger when they are closer together. The same is true of gravity. For example, the sun is the most massive object near the Earth. It dictates most of the gravitational forces in our solar system. It is very, very massive. But it is relatively far away, so even though the sun is a much stronger magnet, so to speak, it is a long ways away. Therefore, the attraction isn't as strong. So let's look back at that law of gravity, the equation, F equals G times M1, M2 divided by R squared. You see, the force of gravity is equal to a number. That's that universal gravitational constant, G, times the mass of object one times the mass of object two. Think of M1 being the mass of the sun and M2 being the mass of the earth. And then we divide by the distance between them squared. This determines the force of attraction between the sun and the earth. You could just as easily plug in your mass and the earth's mass and the distance between you and the center of the earth. And find out how much you are. Yeah, you notice you said the center the of the earth, earth, not the outer crust of so the earth. So what's gravity? Everything is attracted to everything else. Everything. Oh, one last thing, just to make you wonder. What causes gravity? Why are two objects with mass attracted to each other? Well, the answer is, we don't know. The cause of gravity remains a mystery to scientists. We don't really know conclusively what causes gravity. It is one of the great mysteries of science. So we need to know that gravity is one of the greatest mysteries to science. We know a lot about gravity, but there's a whole lot more about gravity that we don't know than what we do know. Sir Isaac Newton just scratched the surface of it. Okay, so that takes care of notes for your class.